five minutes past. That's right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We are back with our morning commentaries. How come the light seems to be dim? I don't know. Can you check, please? Okay. I'm sorry we're late today. Um, we we have been absent for a whole week. Uh oh, what's going on? Okay, we are we are back with our gospel commentaries. So let us today is a very it's a very special day. Let's read um, today's Monday, January twenty second already. And today, today the gospels, I mean the gospels, the bishops in the United States ask us all to pray for the end of abortion. Yesterday, uh, the bishops had requested the priests to deliver homilies related to the end of abortion or ending abortion. But today, we are asked to continue praying and dedicate this day to the prayer for the end of abortion. And uh, uh, today's gospel uh, can be related to that. So let us let us read part of the gospel of today and then we will connect it to this, to this uh, day of prayer. So the scribes who had come from Jerusalem said to Jesus, he is possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. See? By the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. So the gospel continues more, but uh, we will stop there. And I would, I would extend what our Lord says here. Right? What, what our Lord is saying is, that's contradictory. Right? How can Satan destroy himself? So if you're telling me, and he was telling the Jews, if you're telling me that I am the devil, and here I am casting out myself, the devil, from these possessed people, then I am fighting against myself. Right? That's what our Lord means here. See? He would have fought against himself if he was the devil. Right? So... In philosophy, this is called the principle of non-contradiction. Okay? You cannot not be and be at the same time and in the same respect. Okay? Well, you learn more of that in philosophy. That's the philosophy of non-contradiction. Okay? And, and our Lord here is stating that philosophy. That He cannot be something and yet not be that something. He cannot be the devil and not be the devil at the same time and in the same respect. <laughs> because that's what these people were accusing him of being, that he is Beelzebul, he is the devil, okay? the prince of devils. Yet he is casting out these devils. So it cannot be, right? But let us connect this to what, what the bishops are asking us to do today, to pray for the end of abortion. Okay? In this case, okay? in this case, in the United States particularly, that decision of Roe versus Wade which uh, happened in 1973, is practically uh, 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 a, a, uh, a violation of non-contradiction. Here is a state or a nation that has declared in 1973 that it is legal for you as a nation, for us as a nation, to kill our own people. We are a nation turning against ourselves in America. And not only in America, but many other parts of the world. Nations are turning against themselves. That is what's happening with abortion. When mothers or families are killing their own members, when nations as a whole are killing their own citizens, they are practically doing what our Lord has warned in this particular gospel of today where the devil turns against himself and abortion is one of the most devilish acts anybody could commit killing 
your own kind. Okay? Now you see, uh, we are already in 2018. We are how many years removed from 1973? Let's see, how can you do a quick math? How many? You are? We are? 45. 45 years away from Road versus Wade in 1973. Science has come a long way since those years. If in those years we could lie and say, oh, the thing in your womb, you mothers, is just a, uh, it's just a cabbage, as the priest said yesterday, right? Well, <laughs> nowadays with ultrasound technology and everything else that we have around us, we know that it is not a cabbage, right? We know that it's not just a lump of flesh. We know that it is a human being. Well, uh, uh, we don't have to talk about all of these things now. You can all read up about it. We know about it. But uh, it, suffice it to say that today, let us remind ourselves that as the gospel of today tells us, we as a nation will be turning against ourselves. And if we turn against ourselves and we don't overturn this decision of Roe versus Wade by the Supreme Court, our kingdom, our nation, our families will not last. Okay? There's little wonder why there is a crisis in the families nowadays. There's very little wonder why many families are broken, why many families are in disarray, why many children turn against their own parents. Why? <laughs> because it is not remote that many in many of those families, abortion has been part of their family life. Abortion has been part of their community life. Abortion has been part of their national life. And that is why many families... Many communities, many countries are in trouble. Okay? So until we end abortion, we will not see progress in human life. It's Our Lord Himself has said it already in this gospel. is is uh, 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 prophetic as far as that is concerned. And we are seeing the effects of this 45 years after Roe versus Wade and 60 million abortions committed after that. 60 million abortions. 60 million babies whose lives have been terminated unjustly. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, what can we do about this? What can we do about this? Uh, many of us, uh, I mean, we, we, we saw people walking in Washington, D.C. just uh, last Saturday. Uh, throngs and throngs of people protesting about abortion. Um, here in the U.S., in California, uh, we're going to have that opportunity on Saturday also to witness um, definitely throngs of people walking the streets of San Francisco to protest uh, against abortion. But not everybody can walk the streets and uh, pray in the abortion clinics uh, uh, once a week uh, to end abortion. But that is the most important power uh, that we have against this evil. Right? It is prayer, 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 prayer. And let's just, let's just talk about that a little bit. Why is prayer the most important tool, the most important power? And speaking of prayer, I would add specifically uh, the rosary. The rosary, the rosary as the most important tool. Why? Because, because for many wrong things going on in our lives, even our own personal lives, for many evils that uh, beset us and our communities, many times, many times what we forget about those evils is that grace is... Grace has to act on our souls. The grace of God, the gift of God's intervention has to act in our souls. That sometimes no matter how much uh, human uh, activity goes on in trying to cure an evil, okay, no matter how much we lobby, for example, 
uh, against abortion. No, much, no matter how much we march in the streets or how much we talk to our legislators and all that, uh, the, 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 the real clincher at the end of the day, the real clincher that will change things, that will change hearts, that will change minds is the grace of God. The grace of God. The grace of God. But that is what many activists nowadays uh, forget. Forget They forget that the grace of God is the real uh, clincher. The real change agent is the grace of God. It is not our activism. It is not how much we protest and go to the streets. That is sometimes necessary and that is sometimes important in order to make the noise that we need to make. Uh, in a democracy uh, so that people and our legislators and our leaders will understand the people's will, right? All of those are very good things to do. But what we should never forget is that we have an inner power, a secret weapon that we should not forget to use. And that is the power of prayer, the weapon, which is the rosary. Okay? Let us not forget that. And in our own family, we do that. Every day, we pray for the end of abortion. We include it as an intention in our rosaries. Now, folks, that's something that I would also encourage every one of you to do. Include it in your uh, intention for the rosary. Pray for it at Mass every day. Uh, and that is the way that we can end abortion. That is the way that those of us who are uh, perhaps not actively involved in all of these uh, protest movements can pray for the end of abortion. Let me just add as, a, as, a, as an end note here that really abortion in any kind of evil, but particularly abortion, birth control, feminism, all of these wrong things going on in our society nowadays is only a consequence of one thing. Yes, Joe, selfishness, selfishness. That is the only reason for this that couples who are more concerned about their own pleasures and their own comforts in life that's the reason why they engage in contraception that's why they don't want children that's the reason why they resort to abortion that is why these feminists who think that they should have full control of their bodies and they're the only ones who can decide what happens in their bodies <laughs> Yet they engage in all sorts of illicit sexual activity, okay? They're fooling themselves. They want their selfish pleasure. That's what it is. So it, uh, couples who don't want children, who, who don't want children, okay, uh, are, are being selfish. But why did you get married for <laughs> if you don't want children? Okay? So... Uh, those who make those who enter marriage immediately with a decision as to not to have children, they are entering marriage in a very uh, selfish uh, way. That is not the way. Okay? I often tell the story, okay, and we'll end this with these little stories. I often tell the story of how I proposed to your mommy, right? Well, well, I asked her the question, well, how many kids do you want to have? And when she said, well, what about a dozen? Oh, immediately, I went to my niece, right? And uh, unfortunately, we had this one, but anyway. <laughs> uh, well, that's why, you know, when I'm asked, when I'm asked, oh, how many children do you have? I always say, well, we have six for now, right? And we're working on number seven. And we're, okay? Well, because, you know, uh, because that's what marriage is all about. We enter into marriage not with the preconceived idea. I only want two. I only. Want... It's not your decision to make. See, not your decision to make. You have to enter marriage with a generous heart. <clears throat> you have to be generous when you enter into marriage. You cannot be selfish, because if you're selfish, you will end up um, uh, resorting to either contraception. Or abortion, worse, and you know, and many other uh, wrong wrongdoings in marriage. Okay, so uh, when you enter into marriage, you have to be uh, 
generous with God. And, and folks, you know, God cannot be outdone in generosity. If couples are generous to God, with God, as far as having children is concerned, God cannot be outdone. Uh, God is going to reward you. And uh, uh, we, <laughs> my wife and I have our own stories of struggle and, and difficulties that we had to go through. We came to America as immigrants in 2001 with nothing, with nothing. But we were clear about one thing. We wanted to have children. We wanted to welcome all the children God would bring into our marriage. And we did not in any way think about the fact that we had nothing when we came to America. Nothing. And those of you who know us personally, at this stage of our lives, 17 years after our marriage and six kids later, you know that all of this that we have that you see is a product of God's rewards. I cannot attribute it to anything else. We had to work our butts out and we are still working our butts out. But God has rewarded us. In many, many more ways than we could have dreamt of in so short a time of 17 years of marriage and 17 years being in America. God has been very, very generous to us. And, uh, and I can tell you many more stories of, that are similar to that. Um, my own family, my own parents um, did the same thing. You know, um, in, in the case of my own parents, we were, on, uh, we were all delivered by one OBGYN. And I always tell this story also. What's OBGYN? The doctor who delivers you, who was a family friend and etc. And uh, after my brother was born, that doctor was already warning my parents. Hey. No more babies because uh, my mom's uh, uterus, may she rest in peace, my mom's uterus was apparently weak and uh, was going to be compromised with more children. So my parents were already warned, no more children. My parents didn't listen. They had baby number three. Baby number three came, the doctor said, no more children. My parents didn't listen. Baby number four came. Number four was a difficult pregnancy for my mom. She had to be uh, opened up, cesarean section. And with that, the doctor again said, no more babies. They did not listen. Number five came. Number five came. No more babies. The doctor was adamant already. No more babies. And <laughs> my parents didn't listen. No, 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 wait. Number six came, cesarean section. And by that time, my mother's uterus burst. And so, at that time, no more choice. So, they agreed, okay, so now take out the uterus, and that's the end of uh, childbearing years. But, could you imagine if my parents listened, if grandpa and grandma listened to that doctor, to, to listen to science at that time? Well, they would have been stuck with me. <laughs> right? There would be no uh, other uh, PhDs in the family. There would be no uh, great musician in Tita Lala who, who reaps uh, awards one after another. There wouldn't have been all of these beautiful sisters. They would have been stuck with an ugly boy like me. Right? So... Uh, and in the case of my parents, and in our case too, generosity and faith. Just be generous with God. Well, I'll add number three, which is work, 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 work. Be generous, work for it, and be faithful. Have faith, have faith, have faith in God. Those are the three 
key words to keep in mind if you are entering the vocation of marriage. Okay? When, when it comes to children. Be generous. Work your butts out for it. And have faith. You know, again, uh, I always tell parents, you know, couples who enter into marriage thinking, okay, I'm only going to have one or two. That's it because that's all I can afford. Wrong economics, folks. Wrong economics. You don't begin considering children with wrong economics. That's the principle of wrong economics when you begin to assess how much you can afford to do because of your current state in life when you're beginning. Okay? Why is that wrong? Because that only means you have nothing to work for. That only means you don't have a goal to work for uh, providing for your children's future. That is very wrong economics. Don't do that. Okay? Start with a goal in mind. I'm going to have many children. And then you work for it. Work for it. And if you're sincere with yourselves, and if you really work for it and have faith that God is going to be part of the journey, that God is going to provide, and God is going to point you to the right direction, with such good intentions, there's no reason why you cannot succeed. So folks, contraception is not an option. Abortion is not an option. Feminism is a lie. And many other lies have been spread out uh, all throughout this 45, 50 years in order to promote this evil of abortion. And our Lord in today's gospel has given us fair warning. Anyone divided against itself, a family divided against itself, a nation divided against itself will not stand. Let's pray for the end of abortion. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good week ahead of you. Bye. And ask the question, have you ever been aborted? <laughs>